How big is your dream? In healthcare, we are developing huge, audacious goals every day. Healthcare has taken on challenges as daunting as polio and smallpox. We have had our own El Capitans, climbs that seemed impossible at the time. HIV and AIDS, we're about 25% up the way of that cliff. Um, cancer, we're making progress. It's time for zero suicide to be a big audacious dream in healthcare. Now why hasn't it been uh, over the course of time? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual was revised in 1994 and at that time there was a thought of putting it much more seriously into a discussion of suicide and yet we determined not to do that. Why? because there were those who said that suicide is not like those other challenges. Uh, it is an intentional action, a choice that people make. Now, John Oliver has a bit that he calls, how is this still a thing? Today, we're going to ask, how is suicide as a choice still a thing? Now, some things go without saying. Some things are self-evident. They're simply the plain truth. For example, every morning I get up, I, I haven't put my glasses on yet, and I look in the mirror. And from my vantage point, I see a full and healthy head of hair. Now, uh, occasionally I'll be on an elevator and there's a mirror up above and I happen to catch a glimpse from looking down. And I'm like, hey, who's that guy? Uh, but from my vantage point, from my perspective, it seems true. Another example of what appears to be obvious the earth is flat. Uh, this past year, B.O.B. made the headlines. Now, if you didn't know this hip-hop star from his hit songs like Magic and Airplanes, then you may be familiar with his epic Twitter feud with Neil deGrasse Tyson. It started here at Stone Mountain, overlooking the city of Atlanta, all the way up to Sandy Springs. He tweeted, there are 16 miles between the cities in the background, but no curve. Please explain this. Now look it, it's very clear that the earth is flat. Now stick with me for a moment. If we go back a thousand years, it did in fact look very flat. In fact, I have it on good word that right now as I'm speaking, B.O.B. is flying over us in his private airplane and he's peering out his airplane window at the same time that he's singing his famous song about airplanes. If we took a person from a thousand years ago looking out that window, the view of the horizon is still downright flat. Uh, that's the view to the every man. Now, of course, there have always been signs that our limited view as humans was, well, limited. Uh, the first clue, in every lunar eclipse, we see the shadow of the earth cast against the moon. And what do we see? We see a circle. If the earth were not round, we might see something instead like this. Now, my son was watching me put together this presentation, and from his vantage point, he said, look, Dad, it's Pac-Man. And I explained to him that that looks nothing at all like Pac-Man. Neil deGrasse Tyson explained to B.O.B. that you need two things, two signs to prove that the earth is, is, is round. First, we need the Foucault pendulum. It's our second clue, uh, but it demonstrates that the earth rotates. The clue that we started with, the, uh, the lunar eclipse proves that the earth is round. And when we put these two together, and people were doing that long before our modern science and uh, super cool astrophysicists, it proves that the earth is a ball. Now apparently this was way too much looking through a glass darkly to persuade B.O.B., who believes that views like this are the CGI creations of a conspiracy. And to be fair, none of us have seen that view with our own eyes either. But what if we could change B.O.B.'s perspective? Instead of that 16 mile view that we all have, what if we could go one more mile, but straight up, let's make it 17 miles, in that view, suddenly the great big curvature of the earth becomes clear 
and it's the aha moment. But in life, we frequently don't get the 17 mile view. And sometimes, unlike B.O.B. tweets, there are actual consequences to what we believe. Let's talk about another obvious truth. Suicide is a choice. It's not like cancer. People don't choose cancer, but they commit suicide. Now, two beloved actors died in the last two years. We offer genuine respect and love to Alan Rickman, who we said uh, succumbed to cancer. He lost his battle. But our response to Robin Williams was much less clear. The headlines said that he committed suicide and some added that he hanged himself. Now, many in the suicide co prevention community have discontinued using the word commit as it pertains to suicide, but others have not. Uh, I mean, it, it does kind of work, right? We're not in 1800. Uh, we're not talking about suicide being a sin or a crime, but we do think of it as a deliberate action, as a conscious choice. This is something we don't need research to prove. It kind of goes without saying. It's a self-evident truth. It's, it's right there in front of the mirror for us. Let's look for uh, the signs that might indicate that our understanding isn't the pure view. Now, I wish that we could zoom up to that 16 plus one, that 17 mile view and see, but we're gonna have to study the signs. We're gonna have to look at the clues. That, where is that nagging circle shadow of the earth against the moon? Our first clue, falling is not a choice. Several years ago, I was on Fear Factor. That's me, I'm hanging on the left, 40 feet high from the ground from an upside down Y-shaped bar. And I'm pretty competitive. I chose, I made a decision. And that decision was to outlast those younger whippersnappers and be the last one hanging on. Uh, no matter how hard it was, no matter what it took. And that worked very well for me until the very moment that that platform that was holding my weight dropped out from under me. And instantly my hands began to slip on that bar. I was struggling to hold on. I could feel the sweat in my palms. I double downed my grip, but the pain intensified and my forearms began to balloon up like Popeyes. Now I'm a clinician. I told myself, I can handle this. I took some deep breaths uh, that relaxed my breathing. And then I went to my happy place. I'm on a beach with gentle waves rolling against the against the shore. And that worked for all of a few seconds. Ultimately, I was simply telling myself, hold on just one more second, just one more second. It was a long ways to fall. I desperately wanted to hang on, and yet gravity, fatigue, if holding on was a choice, not only would I have been the last one, I might still be there. But eventually, that gravity, pain, and fatigue forced me to succumb. The second clue, the pain is not a choice. Now, from the everyman perspective, we think we get the pain. Uh, we, we don't understand the choice, but we have all had ups and downs in our lives. Uh, grief and sadness, disappointment and loss. And so we believe that that gives us some, uh, some view into what it's like. William Styron, in his book, A Darkness Visible, about his own debilitating and suicidal depression, took the title from John Milton's description of hell in Paradise Lost. No light, but rather darkness visible, where peace and rest can never dwell, hope never comes, that comes to all, but torture without end. Styron said that his own depression was so mysteriously elusive and painful as to verge close to being beyond description. He said it remains that his, uh, his depression and suicidality 
was so incomprehensible as to be next to impossible to understand. He tried to give us a view of it by likening it to physical pain. And yet when I've given this talk before, many people have come up to me and said that they would have chosen physical pain over the emotional anguish that they were experiencing. Clinicians use phrases, I've used phrases like psychic distress. That doesn't seem to really get us to where Styron was taking us when he talked about torture and anguish. The miners who were trapped in Chile for all of those days, initially in total blackness until that four inch diameter hole was drilled to get them a little bit of light. A darkness that is visible, that kind of anguish and pain. Now, some of you who are listening to this are saying to yourselves, I, I, I sort of get it. I hear where you're going with this. But my loved one, my family member, uh, they may have been in great pain, but they made a choice. They took a deliberate action. They ingested a poison or they pulled a trigger. So let's take these two clues. Falling is not a choice. The pain is not a choice. Let's put them together, but let's reverse them because what happens is the person goes through great pain and there's a reaction to that pain. So I took the bucket of ice, I brought it down the hall, I poured it in the tub, and then I turned on the cold water and filled it to the brim. It had been a couple of hours earlier that I finished my first marathon in New York Central Park. I had uh, cramped badly in the last uh, mile. And when my friend Michael and I returned to our hotel, we determined to uh, recuperate the way the professionals do. We would take an ice bath. Now, some of you may have figured out that I uh, had not followed the instructions on uh, how to do that. And with Michael's teasing encouragement to go first, I lowered myself into that ice and water all the way up to my chin. The physical pain I encountered upon entering that tub was instant and unbearable beyond words. I've sort of blocked the details of that, but the core memory is vivid. I was filled with an all-consuming terror that I could not get out of that bathtub fast enough. In the next moment, I was thrashing in the water like an animal desperate to escape the acute pain that I was experiencing. That type of reaction is hardwired in every one of us. Our response to physical pain, to acute pain, is physiological. Our eyelids widen and our pupils dilate. Our heart rate and our blood pressure spike. Our breathing quickens. Uh, in an instant, we are into fight or flight mode. And our body, its own self-defense system, is acting to protect us. I didn't choose whether to exit that bath so much as my primal response was to simply get out. Here's what didn't happen. I didn't ask Michael to roll in a whiteboard so that we could brainstorm out the pros and cons of getting out of that bathtub. I also uh, didn't sit there in the bathtub not having any idea what I should do for 20 minutes until Michael administered the exit the bath survey and I suddenly had an idea that had never occurred to me before. A deliberate action? No. Like any animal in pain, I instinctively bolted away from the source of it. I was propelled. Exiting the tub filled every neural pathway of my mind. And yet my body and my hands thrashed as if disconnected from any conscious decision-making process. Now my examples refer to an acute pain. But consider instead a day-over-day -day anguish that blinds the, the, the person to the possibility of a better day. Perhaps people do not choose suicide so much as they can't hold on any longer. And when their strength and their hope and their resources and their supports give out, then it's extinguished and they fail. From the everyman perspective, suicide is a choice. When Robin Williams died, we said that he committed suicide. In our culture, 
It's by the hand of the taker that is completely responsible for a deliberate action and choice. But it's the limited 16 mile perspective. It's the one we all have. And it falls one mile short of the truth. Now someday we'll have the space station view and with it will come all of the solutions for a zero suicide world. But in this moment we're going to have to study the signs and trust the clues. We're going to have to be courageous and stand behind them. Here's a different headline. Robin Williams lost his battle. Tragically, he succumbed and died of suicide. Loving, respectful, and I believe the truth. When you can't hang on any longer, you can't hang on. I'd like to draw your attention to this actual picture of me falling. And you notice after my left hand fails and forces my fall, it looks as if my right hand is still holding on to an invisible bar. The reality is I never stop choosing to hang on. Sometimes one more moment of holding on can make all the difference. Today I'm wearing the uh, Live Through This uh, t-shirt. Thank you, Desiree Stage. It's simple message, stay. Uh, LiveThroughThis.org. Sometimes one more moment of holding on is all it takes. Believe the signs. Change your perspective. Use your voice. Refuse the single most powerful idea that keeps us continuing to believe that some suicides are inevitable. Refuse the idea that has society investing in saving lives from HIV and cancer and heart disease, but not suicide. Refuse the idea that keeps people who are struggling believing that we don't understand. It's a great big round beautiful earth that we live on together. And it's time for us to come together to support one another, to have the right perspective, and to help each other stay. Thank you.